Hello, everybody. This is uh, Dr. Jason Porter. I'm here with Dr. Casey Senauf, and uh, we're about to start our lecture here on uh, naturopathic approaches for brain injury. Um, I'm going to send everybody a little uh, chat here, and uh, if you're out there, let me know. I think um, um, uh, we make sure our chat is working. Um, we uh, did this uh, a few weeks ago and had a great response, and, um, and so, oh, there we go. Cheryl, so it looks like we have people there. Oh, Dr. C now saying hi to me. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> um, we are really grateful uh, to be here today and uh, to be talking about some things that we, we really like to talk about and things that we have some experience in. And uh, in, in regards to these things, um, uh, we are trying to present new information in ways that are convenient for our patients. And uh, these uh, webinars are new for us, and um, this is our second one. And uh, we're, we're grateful to have um, uh, Dr. Seenouth has prepared um, a wonderful um, a presentation here that's uh, quite informative. Um, uh, you'll hopefully you'll learn some new ideas and things that um, uh, you never thought of before. Uh, it might raise some questions. Um, towards the end of our uh, presentation, I'll be uh, taking some questions and Dr. Seenouth will be answering those. And, uh, and so you can send those questions uh, throughout uh, the, our time here and towards the end, of course. And, uh, and I'll try to keep up with those questions. We'll try to let Dr. Seenouth finish his presentation before we answer the questions. And, um, and we'll go from there. Um, well, let me introduce uh, Dr. Sinoff. Dr. Sinoff is actually a graduate of Southwest College in naturopathic medicine. Uh, uh, he did a, a, a residency there, uh, focused mostly in pain. Uh, he's a lot of, got a lot of great experience and approaches in uh, PRP injections and prolotherapy and in stem cell injections. And, um, and so he loves to treat pain. Uh, he played college, tennis in college, correct? Yep, and uh, right. and um, a very uh, gifted uh, athlete historically. So uh, uh, athletes uh, like Dr. Seenouth, well, they've put themselves through the work. And so they, they know what injuries are and they know what pain is and they know how to work through those things. And uh, so he he's, uh, likes working with athletes and people with pain and helping them get out of pain. And we're uh, really grateful to have his uh, added talents to our office. Uh, Dr. Seenouth has a great... Um, uh, love and passion also for uh, anti-aging medicine. Uh, uh, and uh, that includes a lot of different modalities, including hyperbaric oxygen therapy, uh, neurofeedback, uh, frequency-specific microcurrent therapy, uh, nutrition, uh, diet. And he'll talk more about some of those things that he likes to do. But we know that um, when it comes to uh, either head or the brain, that a lot of these things that we use for anti-aging also apply to people in with new or uh, recent head injuries or chronic head injuries. And so he has a great interest in this area. Well, without further ado, I'm gonna invite Dr. Seenouth. I'm gonna leave the stage and he's gonna take over. And uh, any questions or concerns, please uh, chat with me on the sidebar. Welcome everybody. All right. Thank you, Dr. Porter, for that great introduction. And uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for taking some time this afternoon to be with us here. Um, and uh, thanks for your interest in this topic. Um, hopefully, you get to share some some insights uh, from my experience and from the work that I've done with colleagues to uh, shine a light on brain injury. Um, so let's dive right into it. Give me a second here. I'll see how the slides go. All right. So we're going to talk about traumatic brain injury in the context of concussion. I think concussion kind of is a model for brain injury. It probably is the most, uh, the form of brain injury that most of us have at least some passing familiarity with it. Uh, hopefully not too much personal experience with it though. I know I've been concussed a few times over the years, um, but basically let's talk definitions. So traumatic brain injury, what does it mean? Just broadly speaking, the most general explanation of it would be any injury that affects how the brain functions. How's it going to work? And the most mild form, generally speaking, is what we call con concussion. Now, the goalposts of what's mild, um, it's, it's not a hard rule. 
So for some, uh, in, in some context, that means, did you lose consciousness or not? Uh, if you didn't lose consciousness, it's mild and it's called a concussion. Now, that's not really the most useful um, definition, but it's, it's what we've got and what we work with. Now, how common are these? They're pretty common. Um, about two and a half to four million athletes in the United States each year uh, experience concussion. And that number is probably underreported. There's some estimates that the number might even be 50% higher than that. Um, it's a cause of mortality. Uh, we have 61,000 TBI or traumatic brain injury related deaths in 2019. And so that works out to about 166 per day in 2019. So it, it is common. Um, it is a major cause of, of death and disability. And, you know, anybody can happen to anybody, you know, an athlete, you'd be walking down the street and have a, a fall or an accident and experience a TBI. But there are certain groups of people that are more likely to have long-term health consequences or more severe outcomes. And those include um, racial and ethnic minorities, service members, veterans. Um, we know brain injury um, and associated PTSD is a big issue with our veterans. Um, people who experience homelessness are at greater risk and um, survivors of intimate partner violence are also a risk group. So um, there are these populations that we're very concerned about um, TBIs being a bigger issue. All right, let's talk about the mechanism of concussion. What's actually going on when we say you have a concussion? So think of our brain as a soft organ. It's kind of texturally sort of like gelatin um, and it's encased inside a hard um, bone structure inside the skull. Now, typically the skull is going to protect the brain from injury. It's, it's like its own little helmet that protects it. But if you take a sudden jolt, um, the brain can move around in that space and it bumps up against the inside of the skull. And that can cause some problems because unlike a jello mold, the, the brain has a lot of different structures in it. It's not uniformly um, uniformly made up. It's got, you've got blood vessels, you've got nerve cells. Um, if some of those blood vessels were injured by this bumping around, that might cause a stroke or a hemorrhage or what you might know of as a brain bleed. Um, but the nerve cells are actually really delicate. And there's this diagram here inside this box that shows the structure of a nerve cell. You've got the cell body, which is this wider part on the left. And then you've got this long filament called the axon. And that's um, one of the components that connects these nerve cells to each other, forming our brain circuitry, which allows, um, you know, nerve function and thought and coordination of, of movement and all of that. So those uh, filament-like projections are delicate. So when you have an impact, those stretch, those may get stretched out or they can even be torn and disconnected, which is gonna cause all kinds of neurological symptoms. Now, our brains have this phenomenon called plasticity, which means that um, they can adapt. Our brain, other neuron connections can sometimes repurpose themselves temporarily to take up the tasks that were performed by the injured circuits but there's a cost to that. It's gonna be a little bit less efficient. It's gonna cost more energy. It might not be as effective as it originally was. Now, over time, those injuries heal and you're gonna go back to using your original circuits, your original brain pathways. But in some cases, you can get long-term symptoms that are gonna last. Um, we'll call that persistent post-concussive symptoms or post-concussion syndrome. And that's, we call it when these sorts of neurological changes um, carry on longer than the typical um, days to weeks that concussion typically resolves. And, um, and this can be pretty common. Um, it's, not, it's not a rare thing. Up to 50% of cases can take up three months to resolve before people are back to feeling normal. And in some 10 to 15% of those cases, you can have symptoms for up to a year or even more. So um, long-term consequences of concussion are something that's really, really need to pay attention to. Now, once a person has had a concussion, they're at a greater risk of having additional concussions. So I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, so, and um, you may have heard of some of these uh, conditions like chronic traumatic encephalitis. Those have been following NFL over the last several years. You hear more and more cases of retired players having pretty significant uh, cognitive deficits, mood changes, dementia. Um, it can happen years after they retired, um, and that's from athletes that have sustained multiple brain traumas while playing. Um, so the, the whole 
sports world is getting a better understanding of this phenomenon and finding ways to deal with it, prevent it. Um, some of these patient players have sub-concussive trauma. It's not even severe enough to be called a concussion when it happens, but it accumulates over multiple games, multiple hits, um, and then we end up with this issue. There's also the phenomenon of second impact syndrome, and this is um, this can be really serious. Uh, if an athlete sustains multiple or sequential concussions, um, there is possibility of that triggering um, an out of control brain swelling that can be serious or even fatal. Um, there have been cases of this in, in um, some of our younger athletes, uh, especially those that don't have their, their concussion or injury recognized quick enough. All right, so that's a quick overview of what's happening when you have a concussion. Um, now, the best cure is prevention. So um, definitely be aware of um, ways, simple things that you can do to reduce the risk of concussion for you or your family. Um, super important, buckle up anytime you're driving or riding, uh, wear your seatbelt, wearing a helmet during sports. We often think about that when we're getting on a bike or a motorcycle, but also contact sports. Um, and then things like skateboarding, uh, riding a horse or skiing or snowboarding, these are all things that put you at increased risk of falling and injuring your head. So wearing a helmet during these activities is going to be really great. Um, also, reducing fall risk. Um, so around the house, looking at trip hazards, um, places where kids play, playgrounds, making sure you've got soft landing uh, areas like mulch or things around like monkey bars and stuff like that. Um, or for those of us, maybe you have vision issues, making sure your vision um, your lenses prescriptions are up to date because um, that could put you at risk of falling. So follow some of these steps to prevent the risk of concussion in the first place. Now, some of the people in our families that are at great risk for concussions are those younger athletes playing sports or, you know, even us weekend warriors with those uh, sports put us at risk. So it's really important to recognize um, when concussions happen and that you can get timely and appropriate treatment um, and it's those younger athletes, those kids in school, it's really important for them because they may require more time, more attention to recover than our adult athletes. And why is that? Well, research has shown that the brain is not fully developed until age 25. So thinking about that um, earlier, we talked about plasticity, being that the brain can adapt. Um, and that's part of recovering from these injuries. But when you're under 25, that plasticity is actually just the energy that goes into growing your brain to deal with life. Um, so if you then put on an injury on top of that, um, it's going to take longer to heal because the oxygen, the nutrients, everything that the brain needs to just do its normal development is going to be diverted towards repairing some of this damage and the whole process is just going to be slower. So uh, for kids in school, it's really important to recognize concussion because it can cause lots of different symptoms aside from just the typical losing consciousness getting dizzy that sort of thing but um also can cause social deficit issues um can have issues in the classroom with learning um so all of these functions can really have a cascade of effects for a child that's going through school um and then making sure we do adequate rest and recovery um conventionally there's this stepwise approach to um return to play which i'll talk about in a moment Here is a diagram or chart that highlights the symptoms to look out for. So guardians, parents, um, coaches, trainers who uh, might be working with kids that, that could be potential um, risk, look for these signs. You know, some of them are the ones that we think of, you know, they're gonna lose consciousness. Um, but some other signs might be um, loss of memory. They might have amnesia to the events immediately before or immediately after the hit. Uh, they might have some cognitive issues where they're answering slowly, uh, might have motor issues where their movement looks clumsy or um, un, you know, uncoordinated. Um, in a game, they might forget the score. Or they might, uh, I remember one time I was playing in church soccer league when I was a little kid and I got, got my bell rung and I got off sides because I didn't know what was going on. So um, yeah, look out for these signs in, in the kids that are playing. Um, the athlete might report feeling pressure in their head, having a headache, they might have blurry vision or double vision, um, or it might simply just not feel right. So be vigilant um, and always just err on the side of caution, you know, have the, have take the, take the player out of the game um, so that they can get proper 
proper attention, proper medical care. This might be tough for kids who are playing a team sport. You know, there's a real strong drive to not want to let the team down or to perform or to, you know, just, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of pressures there. So um, we, we do need to uh, take the leadership role here and make sure we're protecting the kids from this stuff. All right. The return to play progression. This is a process. Um, there is a link here to uh, the CDC has some some good information on this. So um, a lot of uh, coaches and trainers for school sports are aware of this. Um, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page here, this is uh, these are the steps of getting back to play. And really important to highlight that this is not a short term process. This is not something that players typically going to go through in a day or two. Uh, this could potentially take weeks. Um, so, uh, again, countering the pressures of performing for a team um, versus the individual needs of getting back to play in a healthy way, um, definitely go through these steps and pay attention. Um, so first step would be back to regular activities. This is um, back to school, back to uh, class. Um, sometimes if, if a student does this student athlete does this and starts experiencing headaches or their symptoms kind of return or come back or get worse then it means they're not ready so they need to take some more complete rest initially and that includes it's you know this is a mental brain uh, issue so that includes mental exertion uh, for some kids thinking of rest taking a day off from school means they're going to be playing Fortnite. Um, video games are mentally taxing so that would be an activity you'd want to limit um, Okay, but if, if they get through that and get back to class, get back to interacting with their friends and peers and they don't have return of symptoms, they're ready to go to the next stage of light aerobic activity. And this would be mild, short uh, periods of getting your heart rate up, like on a stationary bike or walking where you're not gonna be moving the head around very much, important to control that uh, at this stage. Um, if they can do that, then you can move up to some moderate activity, which might be jogging, short running, um, returning to weightlifting, if that's part of the, the, the sport routine. Um, if that once that's achieved without return to symptoms, you can move up to um, heavier non-contact activity like sports drills, uh, full intensity weightlifting, that sort of thing, before moving advancing to practice and full contact, and then moving on to competition. But again, to stress, moving from one step to the next could take several days or even weeks. So um, be willing to go at the slower pace. Okay, I did come across this really interesting study talking about the cognitive motor impairments in children and adolescents. So these are kids that are playing sports in school and having a concussion. And um, I talked a few slides back that there is the risk of the risk of having another concussion goes up when you have after a first concussion. And this really um, the study kind of dives into that a little bit, a little bit more deeply. So um, I want to talk about it for a minute. So we got 100 kids, 50 kids have had a history of concussion, um, 50 kids have not. And they create this, uh, this study to assess something called cognitive motor integration. And the reason why this was looked at is we think about the assessment tools right now that I mentioned some of those on the chart. Um, we're going to do cognitive testing for a kid after they've had a, had a hit to the head. We're going to ask, you know, how many fingers am I holding up? We're gonna ask them to count backwards from 20. We're gonna ask them, do you remember what day it is? These are all tests on their cognitive ability. But a lot of sport and a lot of activity is based on motor ability as well. These kids are navigating the field, they're moving through space, they're coordinating where they know that the ball is coming from their left, the defender is coming from their right, what do they do? This is cognitive motor integration. Um, so this, this study, looked at kids, gave them a task where they looked at a pattern on a screen and then were asked to trace the pattern on a touchpad. And they weren't looking at their hand while they were doing it. So they're uncoupling their motor and their visual cortex. And interestingly, the kids who have the history of concussion, they're much worse at drawing out these patterns. And the performance doesn't match that of their the people in the control group who had no concussion until nearly two years post-event. So it, it's taking up to two years for these some of these kids to recover so that they're performing this task equally to their peers who haven't had concussion. Now think about how if this cognitive motor integration involves a, a wide receiver who's you know trying to avoid a tackle while keeping an eye on a pass that's coming in, um, if they don't have this cognitive motor integration up to speed, they're at risk of taking another really bad hit. 
and that could mean a second concussion, and that could mean this is getting worse. So um, this just highlights both the need for treatment of these concussions in a timely manner, as well as perhaps are we doing enough with our screening tools, our, our coaches, our parents, everybody involved, looking closely enough at the, the risks of infection, of non infection concussion and, and knowing how to recognize it and, um, and take care of it. So that kind of segues into the, my next bit here about the challenges of treating TBI and concussion or just TBI in general. Um, because honestly, the medical, medical paradigm it, it basically says rest. You know, if you have a concussion, you have a traumatic brain injury, just rest. And that's the primary way of treating it. There's not really um, many other tools that are commonly used or like there's no gold standard approach to this. So why is that? Um, there is this issue with primary versus secondary injury. And what I mean by that is primary injury is the stuff that happens when immediately after someone has a trauma, let's say it's a little more severe than a concussion, let's say it's a car accident, they come into the emergency room, the patient might have a skull fracture. They're gonna have contusions. They're gonna have these obvious injuries, lacerations that emergency medicine knows how to treat. So they do that, they treat, um, they treat the acute injury and they do a pretty good job of that, which is great. But we have this secondary injury, which is the result of the changes in the biology in the brain that happen after the trauma and these evolve over time. So you have the consequences of changes in blood flow if you have a brain bleed, changes in oxygenation of the tissue, maybe blood pressure changes happen. We have swelling in the brain that puts pressure on, on different parts. Um, so this increased intracranial pressure causes issues. Um, and these are more difficult to address in this acute kind of scenario. Um, then we have the fact that concussion and brain injury is a multifactorial pathophysiology. It just means there's a lot of different components that are changing and um, it makes it really difficult from if you're looking at a reductionist perspective of what's the cause of the problem, how do you know which stage you're gonna treat it in? Um, so I'll just have a diagram that kind of illustrates that in a second. We also have the issue of cognitive, medical, and emotional impairments. So we have this post-concussive syndrome, um, which can cause problems that last a long time. And they're not just these uh, immediate neurological issues. They're things like chronic pain, changes in mood. We got anxiety, we have depression. We have patients that have difficulty sleeping. Um, and those create their own issues. So we've got this cascade that happens um, and makes this a very difficult situation. So to highlight this uh, multifactorial pathophysiology, I've got this chart and I expect all of you in the audience to remember this chart because I'm gonna have a quiz at the end. Just kidding, there's no quiz. But it does show um, how there are a lot of things going on and how they kind of interact with each other. We've got our head injury, our icon right in the middle of the screen here. Um, and after an injury, you have to the right axonal damage or just injury to these nerve cells, that stretching, that tearing. And then as a result of that, we've got um, a lot of chemical changes that happen in the cells. We have neurotransmitters that get released from these damaged tissues and they excite the cells around them. Now, those uh, some of those neurotransmitters and ions are supposed to be inside the cells. They get released into the brain and they, they activate stuff that's not supposed to be activated. So this can cause symptoms like, um, like sensitivity to light or sound or headaches. Um, then once those, those disrupted cells continue to, uh, that, that situation continues to evolve, we have mitochondrial dysfunction. That's um, down at the bottom here. And that, those are the, the powerhouse of the cells. You know, they stop working optimally. We have the energy state and the tissue goes down and the cells need that energy to function and to repair themselves. So that causes problems. Um, all of this dysfunction in the mitochondria causes the release of reactive oxygen species and causes oxidative stress. So now you've got mechanical stress from the, the damage, and then you've got chemical oxidative stress that leads to damaging of the cell, which then leads to, in the center, we've got the little skull icon, that's apoptosis, and that's pre-programmed cell death. That's when the tissue recognizes that these cells are kind of um, far gone, and it's time to clear them out. And... Uh, and replace them with new cells. But in the case of brain tissue, that cell turnover is really, really slow. So apoptosis is kind of that end result that we're trying to prevent. Um, 
if you go the other way from the head injury, we just have this general inflammation and that that occurs whenever we injure tissue, we have inflammatory changes. We've got activation of, of immune cells um, and that creates a whole nother um, source of this damage. So if you could, if you're trying to develop a drug to treat this, uh, what, what step do you intervene with your drug? Um, it's difficult to know where, where, where it is. And honestly, it's all of these things are, are taking place. So if you were to take a drug that knocks out one step of this, you probably would be missing, um, kind of missing the, the, the point. Um, so keep that in mind. So naturopathic medicine, I'm a naturopathic doctor, everybody here at ev &E, that's what we are. Um, what, who are we, what do we do? If you're not familiar with us, uh, with the naturopathic approach, you know, we are licensed physicians to diagnose and treat acute and chronic disease. And my training focuses on establishing health by supporting your inherent self-healing processes. So for me, and in this condition, you know, I may be using tools like regenerative medicine. Um, uh, Dr. Porter mentioned I, I do a lot of PRP and prolotherapy for in my practice. Um, but for the brain health, you know, we're talking about things like diet, nutrition, and lifestyle. I do acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine. I use homeopathy and botanical medicine and other modalities to achieve this goal. Um, you know, so we're really going to try to dig in, um, identify what's going on specifically with this patient. And, um, before moving on to implement these therapies, really understand their picture. And as an naturopath, we have a lot of different tools to choose from to get that done. Here is uh, just a review of the therapeutic order or um, what naturopathic medicine has to offer. So I mentioned a little bit about getting to the root cause of the problem. We're gonna to try to understand the patient, understand their circumstances, understand their obstacles to health, you know, address the entire patient as a whole. So this is that holistic perspective of not just treating the body, but treat, also addressing mind, spirit, um, and social factors um, play into this here. Uh, we're gonna use both conventional or alternative treatments where it's appropriate. Um, I tend to lean towards more natural drug-free therapies, but sometimes there's a time and a place for a good antibiotic um, or an anti-inflammatory. So um, being trained in both worlds gives us in a position to, um, to recommend the most indicated thing when, it, when you need it. Um, prevention beats cure, so definitely got into that early on, talking about preventing concussion, and then all of this is hinged around the healing power of nature. And our naturopathic therapeutic order. I just want to show this slide because it kind of highlights where my brain is at when I'm looking at a case and how do I decide what treatment to use when. Um, we'll see that this is a kind of a spectrum. We have uh, a patient can present anywhere in any circumstance. We might need to choose which of these approaches is, is the most appropriate at the time. And um, for the purposes of this talk, we're going to be looking at tools on the right half of this circle, you know, so that's going to be things in this realm of therapeutic life changes, which might include, um, which includes diet, includes exercise, includes, like we talked about, the, the stepwise return to sport um, that would fall under this, this category. Um, the blue here, the vis medicatrix naturae, that's the Latin for the healing power of nature. Um, so some of our treatment modalities kind of work at harnessing that ability um, so acupuncture, homeopathy, regenerative medicine falls in there. And then supporting systems and organs. So this is, we understand that the normal function of these tissues and using nutrients, botanicals, and other agents to, um, to shore that up, to support that. Um, on the left side of the spectrum here, we've got things that fall more, some of these fall more in the realm of allopathic medicine. Uh, like if there's a pathology, you remove it, you cut it out, that's surgery. Um, if there's pathology, you use a drug to counteract that pathology or structural integrity. That can be like physical medicine or um, manual therapy, physical therapy, stuff like that. So the treatments we're going to talk about are going to be on the right side of this spectrum for today. All right, so let's talk nutrition. Now, I did dig into some of the uh, scientific research literature for this talk, so it might be kind of dense. Follow along here, um, and then if you have questions, definitely go ahead and drop those questions into the chat. We'll try to address them at the end. All right, so nutrition for, for traumatic brain injury and concussion. There's honestly a, uh, a limited amount of uh, information in the medical literature on using nutrients or using individual nutrients for treatment of brain injuries. Um, 
There's been a lot of work, however, on just testing nutritional approaches in vitro in animal studies just to see what different nutritional approaches do. And there's a lot of overlap between what nutrients that have been used for pain and nutrients that I think could be helpful for traumatic brain injury. So we'll highlight a couple of those. Um, I have a few examples of specific nutrients that I like to use a lot. Um, and and we'll, I have some cases to share um, as well. So getting into the use of specific nutrients, I wanted to bring up this concept of neuroprotection. So a lot of the literature talks about stuff having a neuroprotective benefit. So we want to make sure that we are, we're, we're reducing nutrients that can directly cause harm to these axons, to this, these, um, these brain tissue cells. Um, we know that there are specific ones that, that do that. So I talked about calcium being released from the injured cells and that leads to ex excitation of the, of the brain tissue. And we have this, this concept of excitotoxicity where if you stimulate a nerve cell too much, um, that stimulation becomes toxic and that nerve cell can die. Calcium is one of the things that does that. So we wanna make sure that a person who's having, uh, who's experienced brain injury or concussion is not taking calcium supplements. Um, so that's something that even if you're on that for bone health or for other things, you may wanna take a break while you're recovering from brain injury. There's also um, glutamate, which is an amino acid. Um, that is a, um, an excitatory amino acid. So we wanna reduce glutamate and you might recognize that as part of uh, MSG. Uh, that, you know, I've, I've been told that MSG makes stuff real, real, taste really good, like in uh, the, the dust at the bottom of Dorito chips bag. <laughs> but that, um, the reason that it makes things taste better is that it stimulates this, the nerve cells on your taste buds. So um, that is ex excitation. And if we get too much of that in the brain, it's going to cause problems here. Aspartame is an artificial sweetener that breaks down into a couple of uh, things that affect our neurotransmitters in the brain. So um, aspartame breaking down into aspartic acid can directly excite these neurons that are already in this hyper excitable state. So um, reducing these from the diet is gonna be really important. Um, also, there's the issue of the blood brain barrier. This is the membrane that controls, uh, allows our brain to control what gets in. Um, and when you have an injury, um, you have physical damage to the blood brain barrier and that needs time to heal over. So if you have things from your diet that are inflammatory, uh, maybe you have a uh, food sensitivity, maybe you are gluten sensitive, maybe celiac disease, something like that, um, there's a possibility of that inflammation crossing over and causing issues in the brain, especially in the uh, earlier stages of dealing with a brain injury. So um, addressing intestinal permeability, um, taking out food antigens, or if uh, just some of those common uh, common food allergens can be really, really helpful here. The next uh, specific nutrient I wanna talk about is omega-3 or um, essential fatty acids. So I think a lot of you are probably familiar with omega-3 fats. Um, fish oil is a common source. Um, there are many, many models in animal studies that suggest that omega-3 supplementation is neuroprotective. Um, they're a major constituent of our phospholipid membranes, which is just a fancy word for the cell membranes. Um, they're made up of, of layers of lipid and the, the lipids allow those membranes to be flexible and uh, movable and allow them to do their job. So having more of these omega-3 fatty acids are gonna reduce the amount of errors in those phospholipid membranes and can help them to repair after trauma. Um, DHA in particular is one of those um, if you look at the label of fish oil, fish oil uh, supplement you might have at home, you'll see EPA and DHA. Um, DHA is one of those fatty acids that is, um, it enhances gene expression. So it's really, we give it a lot in like kids formulas of essential fatty acids because it's good for brain development. Um, it's also good for restoring normal synapse activity, which is those connections between the, the, the nerve cells. Um, Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. Um, so they have that effect. Um, so this picture here is a, a CT of a brain and you can see on this right side that there's this dent on the right side of that brain. This is from a case study that I found, um, from uh, 2013. This is the brain scan of a teenager that was in, um, in a car accident and had critical brain trauma. 
the neurosurgeon at the emergency department uh, said that this was would be a fatal injury. Um, the patient was in a vegetative state or a coma for for several days a day. Um, they decided to give him fish oil. Um, he was in on a feeding tube and they gave him fish oil. They gave him really high doses of fish oil. Um, and remember the surgeon said that he was, this was a fatal injury incompatible with life. By day 10, he came out of his persistent vegetative state or out of his coma. By day 20, they were able to take him off of his ventilator. Um, at three months after the injury, he was able to leave the hospital to attend his high school graduation ceremony. Uh, at four months, he was discharged from the hospital. And um, at two years out, he, with intense physical therapy, was able to uh, walk with a, using a cane to assist, and he started a part-time business as a DJ. So this kid um, went from being almost written off <laughs> to, to somewhat of a recovery with high doses of fish oil. So this is just a case of showing how, how the, there's a lot of potential for that nutrient. Okay. Next nutrient I want to discuss is vitamin D. Vitamin D here. Um, so there's there's um, there were some studies that looked at outcomes for adults who had traumatic brain injury and correlated. Were they deficient in vitamin D or were they at good levels of vitamin D? Because um, this is an anti-inflammatory nutrient. It works to regulate calcium levels. It has a lot to do for, with bone health. Um, so people who are, are struggling with uh, dealing with bone issues like osteoporosis may be on vitamin D supplementation. But as we as we've heard several times today, calcium is one of those excitatory um, agents in, in the brain. So um, anyway, the study showed that these folks who had deficient levels of vitamin D at the time of their injury had much lower uh, scores on some measures like um, the mini mental status exam, just a cognitive measuring tool at, at one week and three months post injury. So um, that suggests that supplementing vitamin D can be helpful. It doesn't prove it, but it's a good correlation. Um, vitamin D is a relatively safe nutrient to supplement. So I often put my patients on this, um, especially if we're concerned about brain health. So, Remember this diagram I told you guys to remember, or here it is again, and I've got some check marks on there. So just to show how a single drug approach might look at one of these steps and try to fix it or try to intervene at that step, the omega-3 supplementation can have benefits at all of these blue check marks, axon damage, membrane disruption, because those phospholipids directly um, form the structure of those membranes. We have uh, the omega-3s are antioxidants, so they work here in this oxidative stress category. They are anti-inflammatory, so they work up here. They can directly work against cell damage. And then vitamin D works in these steps with the green check marks. So um, kind of like, um, like a multi-tool or like a Swiss Army knife, so these nutrients can help um, in all of these different ways. So beyond specific nutrient supplementation, what about diet? What about just being on a diet that is helpful for brain health? Um, not a ton, of, a ton of research here either, but what I did find is there is specific research that says that the standard American diet or the SAD diet is bad for post-traumatic brain injury. So consider a diet that, you know, fast food and uh, saturated fat and salt, um, these are bad for brain health following an injury. So um, everybody's different. You know, the correct dietary approach is going to be highly individualized. You're going to have to work with your work with your doctor to figure out what's the best approach for you. But there are some diets that have been researched pretty extensively. Maybe perhaps not specifically for brain health, but there are benefits that can be um, can be translated into into post injury. So first of those is going to be the Mediterranean diet. Now. There's a ton of research. If you go and search this diet, there's a ton of research on how it helps in cardiovascular disease. Um, and this is an example of what we call a nutrient dense diet because it's going to have high levels of vitamins, minerals, other micronutrients, and that's all packaged in a generally low amount of calories. So when you do that, when you have that combination of nutrient dense and lower calories, that has anti inflammatory benefits. Um, and if it's good, good for your heart, good for you know, preventing things like diabetes, that also is going to carry over to your brain. So um, 
generally it's pretty easy to implement work with your physician on finding a specific way to do that but it's going to be rich, generally rich in vegetables legumes fruits nuts seeds um, and going to be lower in consumption of dairy red meat and saturated fat those foods are more higher in calories and lower in vitamins and minerals so um, that's how you do it there is a version of this diet which is a little more specific to brain health but it's been researched more in the context of alzheimer's and dementia and we call that the mind diet so this combines elements of the mediterranean diet and something called the dash diet which is a diet that is prescribed for blood pressure and um, each of these specific foods was researched on how it benefits um, Alzheimer's or dementia. So we have our categories of our foods that you want to eat and your categories of foods that you want to avoid. And some of these are, you look at the picture, it's pretty similar to what was on the Mediterranean diet, but there's a little thing, a couple things are more specific. Like for example, berries are on this list of foods to eat. Um, whereas the Mediterranean diet just encourages fruit in general. Um, the reason being that there have been studies looking at berries and their benefit in cognitive decline related to uh, Alzheimer's and dementia and found that berries are beneficial. So they've just basically took all these studies of things that helped and put them together into this diet. Now, um, I'm of the opinion that there is a translational benefit that if it's good for Alzheimer's or cognitive decline, cognitive decline is one of those symptoms following concussion. So if it helps there, it, I think it would be beneficial here as well. I do want to spend a moment talking about calorie restricted diets or some some type of fasting. Um, there have been a, there's been a lot of research on animal models on what happens when you restrict calories, and there have been specific studies looking at mice with TBI, or traumatic brain injury, and shown that there are benefits. Um, and when these uh, diets have been studied in humans, we have seen benefits like increasing ATP production, that's cellular energy. Um, increased ability of your cells to clean up uh, debris or damaged tissue, improved resistance to stress, and that last line, improved neuroplasticity. So these are all things that will be really beneficial to someone trying to recover from a concussion. Um, there are a lot of different ways that you can implement calorie restriction, um, and uh, working with your doctor, you can help to decide if something like intermittent 5-2 fasting is helpful. That basically means that for five days a week, you're eating your standard diet and for two days a week, you would be fasting. Um, other ways to do it are time restricted feeding where you choose specific hours of the day when you are not eating and then you have a feeding window of several hours in the middle of the day at some time. I mean, in the evening, maybe around lunchtime, whenever it is that you get in all your calories during that time. Um, these are effective ways to induce some of these changes in the tissues. Next diet I want to talk about is the ketogenic diet. Um, this is a really popular thing. A lot of people are on board with the keto train. Um, this diet has been researched a lot in helping people with epilepsy, uh, particularly those who their epilepsy doesn't respond to drugs. So the ketogenic diet can reduce the severity and intensity of that, uh epilepsy, the seizure episodes for those patients. In animals, uh, studies have shown to have neuroprotective benefits. And um, interestingly, in studying the tissues of, of uh, injured brains, there seems to be a shift to using ketones for fuel, um, especially in the post-acute TBI. So right after the injury, um, there may even be a metabolic adaptation where our bodies are our bodies would prefer to use ketones for fuel in that in that injured state. Now that keto, uh, that metabolic state changes and shifts pretty quickly on its um, naturally, but perhaps increasing the ketones in a more sustained or prolonged period of time could be helpful in the brain that's recovering from a concussion. Um, there are a couple of reasons why that might be the case. Um, over here on the right side, I list those. So you'll see that burning ketones for fuel produces less oxidative stress on the tissue than burning glucose for fuel, which is kind of interesting. Um, ketogenic diets, upregulate the mitochondrial antioxidants and ROS scavengers. So again, reduce or increasing resilience from stress. And um, through a phenomenon called uh, mitochondrial uncoupling, the, the mitochondria actually produce more energy um, when they're burning ketones, which is really, really interesting. Um, last step is an anti-inflammatory pathway that gets upregulated. That's the same anti-inflammatory pathway that, that is um, increased when you take curcumin or turmeric, which is another really, um, really popular uh, herb for anti-inflammatory benefits. Ketones have that same effect. So um, lots of benefits to the ketogenic diet. This, I think there are a lot of ways that this could be applied 
um, in the context of post-concussion. And um, stay tuned. I think Dr. Porter in the future is going to have uh, some information on the ketogenic diet. So listen up for that. Okay. So back to this cascade of events, um, orange check marks, added orange check marks to ways that dietary approaches can have effects on these different steps. So if we're looking at doing it uh, dietary and nutritionally, we can, we can hit pretty much everywhere on this, on this web of, of events. And I think that's probably going to be more effective than any single approach. Now I'm going to talk about some of the treatment modalities that we use here at the EVND Treatment Center. Um, these are some of the gadgets that have really been shown to have big benefits for brain health for um, helping people recover from these injuries. Frequency specific microcurrent is the first of these. This is a very low amplitude my, uh, electrical field that's applied across the tissues. Um, in tissue culture studies, they've been shown that these small electrical currents can increase the amount of ATP or cellular energy that's produced by 50 times. Now, that's a lot of energy that's produced and that can be used by the body to repair tissue. So. Um, there have been some studies looking at reduction of pain, reducing inflammation. Um, one interesting study was looking in patients that had cervical spine trauma, so they had a car accident when they had whiplash or something that injured their cervical spine. Um, they were given a 90-minute treatment of this um, frequency-specific microcurrent, and it increased levels of uh, cytokines like interleukin-1, interleukin-6. These are inflammatory markers that are in the blood. Um, you know, decreased some of those levels by threefold. Um, and those levels don't typically change very fast. Um, so that is a very, very powerful and impactful change. Here's a case report from the medical literature of microcurrent being used in uh, treatment of wounded warriors. This was a program, uh, integrated pain program that was designed to treat folks who are suffering from PTSD, um, traumatic brain injuries. Uh, in this case study, a 35 year old male, who was a paratrooper, he suffered from an a concussion from an uh, roadside IED when he was serving in the Middle East. Um, he had a dislocation and fracture in his, in his neck. Um, he had pain all over his body. He also had migraines. He had cognitive uh, deficits. He had memory problems. Um, he had one treatment with the, the microcurrent that completely resolved his chronic headache. Uh, after two treatments, his neck and back pain improved significantly. And after three treatments, his PTSD had started to improve. He reported improvements in memory and clear thinking that lasted for several days following each session. So um, showing the, the power of this therapy here. I have used this uh, modality um, with one of my patients that I worked with when I was teaching at the Naturopathic Medical College. Um, this is a 25-year-old male. He had a terrible accident where he was a uh, motorcycle accident and he had head trauma and um, brachial plexus injury, brachial plexus being the bundle of nerves that supply your arm. They come out of the side of your neck, they go down the arm, and he fell, so his head kind of leaned, was pulled away, and those nerves got stretched, and some of them got actually severed. So that was two months before he came in for treatment, and he had really bad phantom limb pain. So, I mean, he still, he didn't lose his arm, but those nerves were in effect severed. So he had that burning intense pain in his right arm and his hand. When he came in, he had decreased mentation, which is decreased ability to speak. He was, he barely spoke during those first uh, couple of visits and he had a flat affect. So he didn't really demonstrate any kind of mood or any kind of, um, you know, you couldn't tell from him speaking. He actually had a caregiver that came with him and had to tell us his entire history from visit to visit. He got FSM treatment once a week for three months. Um, there's a, a microcurrent concussion protocol that we ran for him. And the outcome at the end of that three months, he had greatly increased his mentation and speech. Um, he went from maybe speaking four or five words during the entire visit to about 50% of the visit. He was able to, um, to tell us what was going on, tell us how his much his pain, how was his pain, how his improvements. He had almost complete resolution, about 90% resolution of the burning phantom limb pain. And um, he started telling jokes with the medical students. So huge turnaround within a three month um, period from a very severe case of a nerve injury, brain injury. The next modality I wanna highlight is acupuncture. Um, Chinese medicine has a long history of being used for these sorts of injuries. There have been a couple of documentaries that you might see on out there on uh, using, using this modality. This case, um, I'm grateful to my colleague, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Jacob Wolf, who I did residency with. He published this case report 
Um, and it's a really, really inspiring story. Uh, this is a 22 year old male. He presented at the clinic three and a half months after a severe um, snowboarding accident. He, cra he crashed and hit a tree. Um, he was in a coma initially, went into the emergency room. He had multiple fractures in the base of his skull. He had uh, diffuse axonal injury, which is basically they, they were able to detect nerve injury in multiple parts of his brain on imaging. Um, when he woke up from that coma, he had retrograde amnesia for one year. So he basically lost a year of his life he couldn't remember. Um, he had some mild cognitive issues. Um, he had some issues with numbers and uh, names. Um, he couldn't walk after the, the injury. He had slurred speech. Um, his vision changed dramatically. He had double vision and blurry vision. Um, numbness and tingling. Poor motor control, basically his whole right side of his body, his right arm and right leg, he had really bad motor control after that. So when he presented, we looked at him from a Chinese medicine perspective, checked his tongue and pulse, and we diagnosed him with, with liver young, rising, chi and blood stagnation, and uh, treated with acupuncture. Um, he came in for treatment over the course of four years. So it was a long-term treatment. Um, and at the end, by the end of the four-year course of treatment, he had a lot of positive changes. Um, he updated his uh, vision lens prescription multiple times over that, that time period. He was able to walk. He initially was using a walker, and then he uh, graduated up to just using a cane. Um, he was able to snap his fingers on his right hand, regain enough motor control to do that, which was really great. And the big thing, he, he went snowboarding again at four years post-injury. Post so this was someone that was in a wheelchair. Um, through the use of acupuncture, um, was able to regain this function. Next modality to cover is the hyperbaric oxygen therapy. This is a picture of our hyperbaric chamber here at EVND. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with what that means, hyperbaric oxygen chamber is a way of um, exposing the patient to um, pure oxygen and at an increased atmospheric pressure, about four atmospheres, so that's four times our normal pressure. And what that allows is the body to absorb more oxygen into its tissues. Oxygen is and used to create, um, create energy. So um, this is a trial of patients who had traumatic brain injuries um, and had this long-term post-concussion syndrome, so six, uh, up to six months old. Uh, the patients received 41-hour treatments uh, once a day for five weeks, uh, or sorry, once a day, five days a week. Um, this was a crossover study. So there was two groups. The control group uh, had no hyperbaric oxygen. The test group had the therapy. Um, there was a very significant reduction in symptoms after the course of 40 sessions. Um, symptom scores dropped from uh, about 39 to 12 on a scale, um, memory index improved as well. And then they crossed over, meaning that the control group who had no treatment had an opportunity to get the treatment. They also had improvements in their symptoms. However, the size of their improvement was less. The magnitude of treatment effect was smaller. So that suggests that timeliness of treatment is important. Getting, getting to treatment quicker might mean better outcomes. Also, two months post-treatment, so two months after the last treatment, most of the improvements maintained. So these were durable or permanent improvements in these symptoms. And the last treatment I want to highlight here is neurofeedback. And this is a really, really interesting modality that we do here. Um, it's a type of a biofeedback that measures brainwave activity. And then we feed it through a computer, which will interpret that activity to sound or visual signals. And using these signals, we can train brain. So um, think of it like exercise, right? If you go, if you injure your leg and you go to physical therapy, you'll have a weakness, a deficiency in, in your, your function. Maybe there's a certain movement that you can't do. Uh, your therapist is going to ask you to do some, do some exercises and um, you'll feel the weakness. Maybe you'll have, maybe it'll be painful. Maybe you won't be as, as strong. You're going to practice the exercises and over time you're going to become stronger and that's going to enable you to do the exercise better. And you'll, so that's your feedback, right? You're going to get this immediate feedback, what works, what doesn't work. Your brain's a little different because we don't have that kind of feedback into our function between different sections of the brain. But the neurofeedback allows us to get a little insight into that. And by having these signals, we can train and we can improve the function of the brain. Um, one of the important tools for doing that is the, the QEEG. 
which is a special map that allows us to see what the activity in the brain looks like. Here's a diagram of one, and these red areas have more activity, some of these green areas are norm more normal activity. And um, so we can use this information to kind of get a picture of what's going on inside the brain beyond just the structure, what we can see on an MRI or a CT scan, but actually the, the function between different parts of the brain. Now there's no specific single QEEG map for a TBI because different types of injuries are gonna be affected in different ways. The different brain areas correspond with different functions. So like the visual cortex is gonna be in the back of the brain mostly, the, post, the sides of the brain are where you're gonna have your motor and your sensory areas. So we can look at the activity and see where these light up on this uh, QEEG and that might correspond with deficits that the patient has. And we can also look at what wavelength the electrical activity is at to see if it's like a, at a relaxed state or a hyper aroused state. And we can train it back into normal ranges. Um, so because the set of TBI symptoms is so broad, so varied, um, you might have different locations where these injuries could happen. And this gives us a really unique, unique insight as to like where a patient is initially when they start treatment. And then we can do these follow-ups to see how the connections are improving over time and with therapy. So um, there have, there has been um, some research done um, on using uh, using neurofeedback for pain management in patients who have had TBI and PTSD. These, this is a study done in veterans and it's from earlier this year, so it's fresh new research. Um, these, these patients did neurofeedback for three months, averaging you know, two sessions a week, um, like once every three days, basically. They reported lower pain intensity, less interference in, of their pain in their lives, uh, less depression, less PTSD, less anger, uh, better sleep, and less suicidal ideation doing three months of neurofeedback. Um, two out of every three sessions, they reported an immediate reduction in their pain level following the session. And that's basically just about an hour of sitting um, with connected to this neurofeedback device. So it's kind of like a meditative experience, time for rest, reflection for these patients during these sessions. But they, they across the board, related, uh, reported good improvements. We have a case report from here at EVND. And, um, uh, Sherry, our, our neurofeedback tech, shared this with me to share with you guys. Um, there's a case of a nine-year-old male who had a traumatic brain injury in a car accident, and he had the unique circumstance of being locked in after the accident. He had this, um, he basically appeared to be conscious and aware, but had total loss of voluntary motor control. So he couldn't speak, couldn't blink, couldn't move his arms, his legs to respond to things going on around him. The initial course of treatment was 20 sessions of neurofeedback, and he was also seeing specialists, seeing neurologists, seeing physical therapy. Um, at the end of the 20 sessions, his physical therapist reported that when they were working on their assisted lower, lower limb exercises, that he was able to squat voluntarily without, a, without you know, having to be in with a, getting assistance from the PT. So voluntary lower motor extremity control. Um, very, very big dramatic change. Within three months, the patient was able to voluntarily extend his arms. So he would do like fist bump with people. And uh, he started blinking, you know, that whole uh, blink once for yes, two for no. He was able to use that as a communication tool when he was un otherwise unable to speak. So um, that was a, a big shift. And um, all of his specialists on the case um, all kind of agree that the neurofeedback was kind of this common thread among all the therapies that he did that was having a very significant sustained impact. Okay, so that kind of rounds out the modalities I wanted to talk about. I just wanted to um, kind of sum things up. You know, this naturopathic medical approach and looking at uh, integrating all of these, this big toolbox and, you know, being able to decide what what therapies are helpful and, and when, um, you know, as part of this integrative healthcare approach. And a lot of these modalities would sync up with with uh, or can can help um, if you're, you're getting treated by a conventional doctor or neuro neurologist or specialist, these tools can also all fit in that approach to create, um, create an effective um, treatment approach. There are treatment options that exist to help relieve these symptoms of post, uh, post concussion syndrome. Um, you know, beyond just the old conventional, you know, rest and, um, it'll get better. I've heard so many patients say that their, their primary care doctor told them, you know, just rest and it'll heal and it'll get better. But, and, you know, it does for a lot of people, but for these folks who have this, uh, these longer, longer lasting symptoms, you know, we need options. And I think that 
this talk kind of highlighted some of those options that I think can be really, really impactful. And finally, I think the multimodality approach has the potential to be more effective than any single therapy. And I hopefully I drilled in on that, that chart, that complicated web of, uh, of the path of physiology. But, you know, if you use these, these approaches to hit all of that, you're going to be way better off than just trying to do one thing at a time. And I think, you know, early treatment and adequate treatment is going to be um, key in getting over these symptoms as best as we can. Okay, um, so that that wraps it up. Um, thank you for your attention. I uh, really appreciate you being here. And um, at this point, I'd like to just uh, check in, see if you have any questions or any um, anything else you want to talk about. Hey, thank thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Sinalf. Uh, uh, an awesome presentation. You know, one thing about um, nat natural medicine or naturopathic medicine and about our office, we look at trying to prevent uh, conditions. We believe that a lot of things that are out there, we don't like to wait and see. And so, of course, if you have uh, specific things that come up, please uh, let us know as far as uh, individual things. I'm going to share uh, in the handout section. I don't know if you have a Casey, but I'm going to share it. I have it on my computer. Mm -hmm. a brain injury questionnaire. It's a questionnaire that we've developed in our office uh, from evaluating many um, questionnaires that are available out there. Uh, it's a quick way to look at and see if, if somebody that you know or somebody that uh, recently has had a head injury, are they having any effects or side effects? And um, upon evaluating that, uh, you can seek a, a, a consultation with one of the doctors here and, and see if there's any treatments that would be uh, available. Um, uh, I'm going to go to, uh, I think we have some questions here, Casey. Um, I'm going to try to read these to you and, and uh, let's see how, do your best to answer them. Um, how feasible is microcurrent treatment 30 years post injury? Uh, uh, one, we have a 20 year old with multiple concussion, two injuries within six months of each other, and uh, two, a 30-year-old post-cervical spine injury at C5, C6 with phantom pain in left arm hand. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think there's multiple questions in there, yeah. um, maybe multiple patients. Well, I think that's, you know, that's a really great question. And um, before I got into this realm of treating with, with microcurrent, I would have thought that some of these cases were just at that, that stage where you kind of just have to wait and see what happens. But I think, um, you know, my experience with that, that 20, uh, was it the, the guy with the motorcycle accident, um, seeing that case and seeing the improvements that he had, though, you know, they were modest improvements, but I think in terms of his ability to interact with the world and get by, um, it was a huge change. Um, and I, you know, I was honestly, I was kind of surprised that microcurrent had that big of an impact. Um, so I think, yes, there is a potential for microcurrent. I think we do have to be kind of um, cautiously optimistic about it because um, like that patient, he, he did not regain much motor control um, in his arm from that brachial plexus injury, but the pain was greatly improved, you know, so that allowed him a greater quality of life. So um, the microcurrent does, I think, it, I think there is a potential in, in each of those scenarios that you highlighted. Um, 20 to 30 years post injury is, is a kind of a trickier, um, trickier situation. Um, because like I talked about plasticity, neuroplasticity, it does exist. Um, but you know, your brain's going to kind of rewire over that, that span of time. And mm. the longer that your, the longer that your brain is, is rewired, the more it's going to rely on those new pathways. I say, it's kind of like, um, you, your brain, just like learning how to play the piano, you know, you practice it, you practice it, you practice it, and it becomes ingrained. So um, the new way of function is going to be going to be kind of the how things are going forward. I, Dr. Porter, do you have any thoughts on on that longer term injury? I like your thoughts so far, and I, I kind of agree that the brain. The thing is, I, the sooner we start with therapy, the better. But I know a lot of times people end up waiting. And, and trying to figure out the, do things recover on their own. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I think when it comes to pain, it seems to me that pain is much easier to get rid of sometimes 
than it is to return motor function. Uh, the, the brain falls asleep in different areas and it may not be able to recover that motor function if it's uh, doesn't if it's not active soon enough. Mm -hmm. uh, but pain, um, there is some potential for, uh, I think, um, uh, evidence that um, uh, different brain therapies such as FSM and neurofeedback and possibly even hyperbaric uh, that might improve uh, phantom limb pain. Yeah, absolutely. I, I There's some good I, evidence. I think what I think what we're trying to do with a lot of these therapies is support that that plasticity, where we know that the brain can kind of rewire to to take to make up for the deficits. And as I said, that usually the new pathways are less efficient, less effective than the original pathways were, which is why, you know, someone who has these cognitive deficits might only they might not have the same endurance for mental work that they did before because it tires them out. Um, you know, if we can increase that resilience, um, we can allow our patients to have closer to their, uh, you know, original quality of life or ability to function. Um, so that's where I like to see these these tools used. I, I know there's a lot of research going on in this area, uh, and um, and I think there's going to be uh, in the future a lot of really bright and hopeful uh, therapies. Mm -hmm. I, I know I know there's a lot of research there in this realm. Another question here. Is pulse electromagnetic therapy the same as microcurrent therapy? Mm. Yeah, that it's actually not. It's um, it's similar in that you know they're using current, but the pulsed electromagnetic therapy relies on um, basically electromagnetic coils that they alternate in frequency, so they create this push pull effect with the magnetic field, and that when you put a uh, next to a fluid like blood that has you know water cell water uh, molecules in it it's going to have a push pull effect on that that fluid so um there are some pulse electromagnetic therapies that have been used to improve circulation for example um i've seen a lot of studies using that for um for wound healing uh if you're to have a diabetic ulcer for example sure. and it can help a lot with that but it, it's a different um approach than the microcurrent where we're actually applying electrodes to the tissue and running current into the tissue um, so hopefully that kind of explains the difference. Um, I have used pulse electromagnetic therapy, um, with patients who have had, um, concussions, stroke, uh, different types of injuries, and the effects are difficult to quantify. Um, it, it's something that I think works. Um, I've seen one device used that was marketed to be used as like a bit on, on someone's mattress and they would run the, the pulse electromagnetic frequency all night as they slept. And that would supposedly increase, uh, have a circulation improving benefit. And that, you know, very frequent and very long-term application had, had some potential benefits. I've seen some studies that um, it worked for conditions like, um, like diabetic retinopathy where the blood vessels in the back of the eye were damaged from high blood sugar and that helped but it was took something took a lot of treatments over a long time so that's kind of a tangent but hopefully that that answers you yeah thank you thank you dr Sheena. another question um again i don't sometimes these questions like can we stump the doctor mm -hmm. is calcium supplementation also contraindicated for epilepsy that that's a good question that honestly, I, I don't specifically know the answer to that one. Yeah, um, I don't, I don't either. That's why I'm <laughs> I was feeling stumped. <laughs> okay. Reading the question too. Um, I, again, I think um, there are different forms of calcium and it may depend on the source and the form of calcium, how well it's absorbed. Mm -hmm. As again, there's, there's uh, some newer forms out of Canada that are highly absorbable and may be effective in some scenarios. So again, I think that I, I, I think the verdict's out on that one still potentially. So uh, another question here, sorry if we couldn't answer that question uh, uh, perfectly, Lisa. Uh, another question, um, um, well, I think, I think that kind of concludes the, the current questions. Um, yeah. All right, well, we thank everybody for uh, being here and participating uh, with us this day, and hopefully uh, we're gonna uh, hopefully get this video posted. Um, if you missed anything, we're gonna get this posted on our website uh here in a few uh in a, in a few weeks and um but if you have any questions or concerns in regards to uh, a potential uh benefit 
again, we, we do know that uh, neurofeedback, hyperbaric, FSM, they're very effective uh, in a recent uh, issue and, uh, and they can be very effective in the chronic issues. And so we can meet a lot of people uh, in different you know, situations uh, over, that, over the time spectrum. So uh, please let us know if we can help or if you have any other questions. Thank you again, Dr. Sinoff. Yeah, appreciate thank it. you, everybody. And uh, it was right. great spending time with you today. All right, thank you. Have All a right. good night, everybody.